Okay, I've just hit launch. We should start seeing people join. Jen, I'm just going to turn your uh, camera off, okay? Or you can do it actually if you want. Yeah, there you go. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, things are going really well, Doug. This uh, webinar, we're having uh, tons of questions and lots of interactions. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping people are enjoying it as much as I am uh, having a gas presentment. It's, it's been yeah. really cool. Absolutely. So we've got people uh, starting to uh, file in here and we've got, looks like um, so far, a uh, portion of the attendees have voted at letting us know where they're located. And so it looks like, again, we're spanning right across the country and even uh, someone from the United States, uh, but with the majority of the attendees here in Ontario. So what I'll do is, um, let's see, it's about 101. Looks like a few people are still starting to join us. That's okay. I will end this poll and I'll just share those results uh, just for everybody to see. There you go. Most of the people so far from Ontario. And I will share our next poll. I uh, just want to know what occupation are you in? your builder or utility if you scroll down there's quite a few options there if uh, if none of your if your occupation isn't listed just let us know in the chat uh, what it is that you do all right so it looks like most of the attendees have uh, voted here. So again, uh, we have uh, builder renovators are the number one category with uh, engineers and architects uh, tied with suppliers and manufacturers and uh, a consultant from, um, uh, from, from the United States, Hal. Um, your friend Hal, Doug, is on uh, the call here. So that's fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And we've got technical advisors and other people on there. So, okay, that's awesome. So I'm going to stop sharing. So welcome everybody. My name is Stephanie Coleman and I work with Building Knowledge Canada. And so I wanted to welcome you all to the four part series that is with Doug Terry uh, called Ble From Bleeding Edge to Leading Edge, A Builder's Guide to Net Zero. And uh, so Building Knowledge is, is facilitating this event and Enbridge is the one that is sponsor. And I'll talk about them in just a minute. So just, just some brief uh, housekeeping as I do with every webinar, uh, you'll notice that um, if there's any issues, actually what we should probably do is just get everybody to raise their hand just to make sure that we can hear, uh, that you can hear me all right. Excellent, lots of hands are going up. Okay, thank you so much. You can put your hands back down. We use the Q&A function that you see at the bottom for questions. It works best uh, for answering questions. So if, if you do have a question for uh, Doug or for Jennifer who's joining us today, um, please feel free to enter that into the Q&A and we'll be taking up those questions throughout. Uh, we have gone long the last couple of webinars uh, because we've had so much great interaction. And so what we do is we collect all the answers um, to the questions that were outstanding and we send those out to everyone. So um, we have uh, a, a number of questions compiled and so you will be receiving those uh, a little bit later. Uh, use the chat for any sort of like if you have technical issues or just some general comments that you'd like to make, um, use the chat please. And uh, so Doug, if you could just uh, put it through to the next slide, which is the Enbridge slide. So Susan Cudahy is, uh, is from Enbridge and uh, she won't be joining us today, but uh, she wanted to send her regards and we wanna thank Enbridge for their sponsorship of this webinar uh, program, the Advanced Building Science Webinar Program and for Doug's four part series. And, um, and so she'll be joining us next week. So up next is Doug, Doug Terry, and he is the Vice President for Doug Terry Homes located in St. Thomas, Ontario. He's the past president for the Ontario Home Builders Association, and he's also the OHBA Technical Chair. He's been that for a number of years. He's been a member for the CHBA Net Zero, as well as the Technical Research Council. Uh, I was very pleased to be able to present to him the 2019 CHBA Member of the Year. And a number of months ago, he also received 2019 Enterqualities 
Home of Fame inductee, uh, Hall of Fame inductee. So Doug, you are up. Okay, thanks Steph. I uh, can't believe we're into round three here. So pretty fired up, same as round one and round two. We're gonna just pretend like we're NASCAR, put the foot on the gas and get going. So the first thing is I have to say a big thanks to our sponsor Enbridge for giving us this platform. And uh, you know, they're forward thinking and, and that's really needed in today's uh, industry as we as we try to go through the rapids of this, of this changing uh, in our society and how we build. Uh, as always, building knowledge is here to, to share the journey with me and having Steph along has been fantastic. Really appreciate all the work she's done for guiding me. What you guys don't see is the background work that we do to have to put something like this together and then the, the testing that we have to do in order to make that all part work. It looks like we got we had Andy Oding for half a second from Building Knowledge, so good to see Andy's joining us. And then last uh, but not least, the seed funding to make all this possible was from Natural Resources Canada, so I really appreciate their uh, their faith in me to bring forward this program. Okay, so uh, I'm going to change this slide up a little bit. It's a little bit about my own personal credits, because if you're all saying, why the heck would I listen to this guy? Well, okay, so I am a BCI and qualified host designer uh, for House and HVAC. I am HRI certified for heat loss, heat gain calculations, and also air system design for residential. And I'm also a CNRPP certified for radon measurement and crunch course, which is new home installation. And last but not least, I've done humanitarian missions down to Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. So I've seen how the poor live and what it means to have housing that works and can take care of our families. And this is why, this is slide number three, Grandbaby Corbin. Guess what he did yesterday, Steph? He walked first time. That is amazing. It was pretty cool. He did the little triangle, dad to mom, mom to the camera, back to dad. It was pretty fun. So this is why we got it. We got to take care of our planet because we got to take care of the grandbabies. Okay, so the agenda and objectives for today, we're going to look at basement walls, as I call it, the strange case of Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, Windows, human versus machine design, uh, high performance HVAC. We're going to look at four strategies. We've got a special guest coming up for that. Uh, heating, cooling, ventilation, and humidity strategies. Okay. All right, some evolving thinking. So during last week's session, a question was raised about why I didn't show more wall options besides the one with the foam. Uh, I would say that during the presentation, I made uh, people aware of what's going on with the Canadian Wood Council and the link we had to over 16,000 walls. So hopefully if, if folks are really wanting to do more of a drill down on different wall types and, and how they might work, go to that calculator. It is just fabulous, okay? But I wanted to go a little bit deeper and, and to address this question a little bit more directly, I want to reply, and I'm gonna give it to you maybe two parts here. The first is there's a lot to think through when building a high performance home, especially in a production setting where you have to be able to replicate the results constantly and you have to make it almost identical so that you, you, you get continuous same performance. Secondly, our thinking is evolving as we continually learn. So what we then have to look to how to apply our newfound knowledge while still balancing the need to produce a home that we sell and that we can sell. It's no good to build something that nobody will buy. And, and so there's a lot of different variables that we have to look at. So in a few slides, I'm gonna walk you through evolving thinking. But first I want to put out a small challenge to the builders and the renovators there. It's a friendly one. Uh, what's on your walls, okay? So just real quick, like, uh, as I presented a couple slides ago, or a couple of sessions ago about Graph and Stone, this product has zero VOCs, uh, which means it's not having off-gassing, making it healthier. Uh, many of the products absorb CO2, so that's helping to reduce our carbon footprint. But more importantly, folks, and this is where I'm saying the healthy challenge, is that we have to start thinking in these high-performance, super tight homes, what we're putting on the walls because we're exposed to a lot of chemicals, even with products that are zero VOC. The biggest reason is, is in Europe, as I stated the other time, there's about 1300 chemicals that have been banned in Europe and there's been five in the States and relatively in that ballpark for Canada. So there's a lot of chemicals, especially on preservatives and things like that, that we don't even know are there that are bad for us. So uh, we as a company are moving towards uh, getting into indoor air quality as a serious concern as we're getting into further down the net zero path. And so what I'm looking at here is I'm, I'm suggesting to folks, uh, we're gonna replace latex paint probably completely within the next year. And we're launching my home as a tree. And I'm asking for other folks to consider, or the, is it willing to look at my home as a tree? Because I think it's very important. We can't just look at 
energy performance, and even carbon reduction, we have to think about occupant safety as well. Okay, so anyway, I'm off my soapbox on that stuff. Thanks for enduring. Okay, Basement Walls, Jekyll and Hyde. It is an awesome Gothic novel by a guy named Robert Louis Stevenson back in about the 1880s. So it's called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I think that that is the perfect analogy for basement walls. Steph, you've seen every capacity of a basement wall, sweating and water everywhere, right? Yes, and they're hard, like basement mm -hmm. walls are hard, but you know what? It's because you can see them, right? So when we look at summertime and wintertime conditions, and they do change, obviously, that's why it's the Jekyll and Hyde piece. With basement walls, you've got the summertime inward moisture migration, and that's when you see the water, the poly blooming with, with vapor on it, right? In the wintertime, you see the outward moisture migration, and you don't really notice that until you get the phone call, there's water on my floor, right? So what we've found in the past is to avoid what I've called previously the, the poop sandwich, and you know the, the diaper on the wall is what we call the bag wrap, right? The diaper. Uh, it's a great way to hold water into a, a, a wall assembly really good. So what a lot of times builders will do to avoid that is they'll cut the poly and that works really great in the summer, except in the winter time, maybe not so much because it means you're opening up a path for all that warm moisture in the home to go out and hit the cold concrete or the frozen concrete. And then it freezes because it's cold. It's really cold. So it freezes and then it thaws. And you know what happens when it thaws? It goes to the floor, right? And then we get that phone call. So there's a problem with not properly creating your wall assembly, right? So energy movement, right? We know the basics of this is that heat goes from hot to cold, moisture goes from wet to dry. Energy is in constant motion. And what we need to understand is when heat goes from hot to cold, that's actually when you see hot air rising as people calling it, that's the stack effect, the heat is climbing. But heat doesn't just move upward. Heat goes from hot to cold. So if you're standing on a cold basement floor, you're going to lose energy out your feet, right? And that's going to make you feel colder. Well, that's still the same detail. It's still the same issue happening. Um, the next thing is, is because that floor can get colder, it can actually be even colder at the walls. And the reason for that is because we used to only partially insulate our walls, and then we'd have the hot air from the home warm the soil and because it doesn't happen now it's now going underneath the floor so our floor is getting even colder and that's why sub slab insulation becomes cr critically important this type of effect though as well is also able to cause drafting especially around poorly sealed uh, windows doors and outlets so for reducing heat loss and increasing comfort it's not just about better insulation it's also really about better air detailing less air leakage reducing it and we talked about that in a fair amount of detail the other day uh, so then there's two moisture, uh, moisture which migrates from wet to dry. This occurs principally in two ways. In the summertime, as I said, the moisture is trying to get into the home because you've got hot, humid air outside and cool, dry air inside because you're air conditioning, right? In the wintertime, it's the exact opposite effect. So we've got both moisture and heat going in the same direction at the opposite times of the year. So it's important to just understand that little bit of basics. So there's two strategies in order to kind of cure Mr. Hyde, as it were, reduce air movement through the wall and enable moisture to leave the wall. So how do we do that? Well, the good news is, is there's a couple of really easy options with off the shelf products. So it, it isn't really that difficult, but it's important to do because there isn't much worse than the phone call that have people saying my basement is leaking, leaking except for perhaps when they say I have mold, right? Because that really freaks customers out. So here's, here's my thoughts on this. Number one is stop air and vapor migration in the winter and allow vapor to migrate out in the summer. And if we can achieve those two things, we can really make a wall system that works a lot better and cut down on those really expensive follow-ups. So years ago, uh, we did a case study with Rockwell. I think it was back in 2013, where we created what was called the optimum basement wall. And so there's four basic principles. Limit the ability of water to enter the wall, use materials that won't trap moisture, change the location of the air barrier, and allow drying paths for moisture to migrate. So in the first case, it allows the wall to dry over time. Uh, the second one is, is the moistures that won't trap, uh, materials that won't trap moisture, the, the rock wool is really permeant. It'll allow vapor to migrate through. 
The changing of the air barrier is one that people often miss though. And, and typically they're gonna take their house wrap and they're gonna attach it to the foundation. And that does really nothing to stop air from migrating into that wall. Whereas if we use the poly in the front and come over top and connect that and make that your air barrier, it does a much, much better job, except for there's one point to that. And that's, that is you still have the, the summertime inward bound to deal with stuff. So what I found is using a uh, smart membrane, uh, there's a great product by Certainty. There are new ones coming out on the on the market nowadays. But in combination with whatever your choice is for a mineral wool product, that is really good because it you know obviously we heard the other week it helps to lower your carbon footprint. But but as importantly, it'll allow vapor to migrate through and get out of the wall, right? So we want to put the combination of the two together, and then we can develop a really really good wall, right? Um, so the good news is, is there's products that you can get at, you know, home hardware or whatever your distributor is, and, uh, and they typically are now stocking this product in their system. So it should be fairly easy to order. You might have to allow a bit more time right now because of COVID though. So that all worked really good right up until we had to deal with radar. Yeah, that, that was a bit of a challenge. So the problem with our challenge with using mineral wool insulation is it's vapor permeant. And if vapor can get through it, so does radon, right? So we changed our detail to being, uh, in, in fact, I remember when we were first trying to figure the sub slab insulation out and trying a bunch of different ways. Uh, at one point we actually were putting rigid board down. And, and I remember my, my buddy, the building inspector, Jamie, he said, well, Doug, I just keep a roll of tape with me because every time it cracks, I just tape it up for you. Ow, that's that's brain damage right there. So we ended up changing out to uh, two pound closed cell spray foam insulation underneath that slab. And that works really great. We actually connect the detail up over the footing and connect it to our rigid insulation, which is on the walls. And as a production builder, it's we found it as, as reasonably cost effective as we can make it work. Um, so that's basically more or less our current detail. Now people will ask, yeah, but the, the foam isn't bearing. So when we get to the bearing locations, the foam connects to your pad, but does not completely cover the pad, but it connects enough that you're not getting a uh, radon to migrate through it. Just so folks know that before they ask the question. Why is radon important? Remember when we were doing the run through the other day, I couldn't remember, it's polinium. So it's not radon, right? That's the issue. It's the daughters of radon, polinium. And that's what the Russians used to kill all the spies, you see, is polinium poisoning, right? So we really don't want that because it can potentially cause cancer for us. And what happens is, is when, when the lump cells are damaged by the polinium, they have the potential to result in cancer, right? So not everyone exposed to radon will develop lung cancer. The time between the exposure takes quite a bit of time for it to show up. It's the continued exposure over a long period of time. And the higher the radon level, the greater amount of frequency you're getting the polonium into your body and, and thus resulting in the potential for, for cancer, right? It is number one cause for non-smokers for, for lung cancer though. So it's pretty serious. And it's, uh, it, it's about 3,000 uh, 3, deaths a year, 3,200 deaths a year by radon. So compared to COVID, it's pretty tiny, but as a standalone, it's much larger than say fires and traffic fatalities and things like that. So it's pretty serious. We need to take it seriously. And then a lot of us would say, well, I don't need to do it in my area. Well, the code actually says, unless you can prove you don't have an issue with soil gas in your area, then you have to put in a soil gas barrier. And my challenge with the code is, and I've been fighting this battle for quite a few years at the, at the code level, is that you can't prove that you don't need a soil gas barrier unless you do a 30 or sorry, a 90 day test. And you have to do that in a closed environment. It doesn't work in an open environment. Ergo, the home has to be finished before you put in a soil gas barrier. And so it effectively says you're gonna put in a soil gas barrier without actually telling you that because sometimes the code does that to us. But these are the areas in Southern Ontario where we can see the, the level of concern for radon. So it's, it's in where we are. And the other thing I would say about this is, although I'm using a slide for, for Southern and Central Ontario, uh, CNRPP has got some really great information. They offer great courses. I'm trained on a couple of their courses. Um, go to their website and look for the information if you want. And so the CARS website is down at the bottom here for everybody, okay? I'll send uh, that in the resource email as well. Yeah, okay, perfect. Now as well, um, this is actually from BSF Waltite's uh, website and it's their, their solution. So I'll make sure folks get a copy of that, but 
we actually, I think the first time we did this was on Project Hope and we just, we had to do it because of speed. Uh, and we tried it and it was like, hey, this is kind of cool. We should do that. And then as we did more research, we found there's CM, CCMC compliance for uh, uh, it being used as a radon detail. So this is uh, fresh off the presses here. Slide one is a continuous air barrier through the header and then it connects into our house wrap, which would go down in front like I talked about. Number two is the soil gas barrier. You can see the purple colored foam that's hitting the, the blue styrofoam. Uh, number three is the full height stud. So that's if you took uh, slides one and two together, what the center looks like. Number four is this really cool thermal break detail that we do at the windows. So when we actually put our, our windows in place, we don't use a pour in place window, we use a set in place window. So when we frame our buck into the, the setting for putting the foundation wall together, we actually add another two by four strip on the inside edge of the foundation wall. And the reason for that is because when we pull that buck out, we've now got this space. So the window goes in in the front, it gets foamed in place, but then the blue foam, that's actually on the edge, not on the flat. So it's actually a thermal break over top of the concrete. So it's an inch and a half thermal break over top of the concrete. So you're not gonna get that moisture transference going from the frozen concrete into your wall uh, framing, or sorry, your, your, uh, your trim detail when you finish out that window. It works great. It's a little bit more detailed, but it, it really works very well. And then lastly, the finished wall. And oh my God, stuff it looks the same as what we were doing before, except for one exception, right? And that is that uh, we don't have the smart membrane on there anymore because with an inch and a half of foam, we don't need it, right? Now, before folks uh, ask this question as well, on this center one and on the one to the, to the left on the bottom, you see that a darker line there? That's because the poly is laying on the floor and so moisture is getting trapped under that poly temporarily. As soon as we lift that up, it's gonna dry up. So there's nothing wrong with that space. It's not leaking or anything like that. It's just trapped moisture that will disappear as soon as you raise the poly up. Okay, so this detail worked great right up until you have to consider your footprint for carbon, you see. Now, the good news is, is that we are uh, anticipating eagerly that carbon is going to change from, uh, sorry, the, uh, the blown foam is going to change from an HFC blowing agent to an HFO blowing agent, which will significantly reduce the carbon footprint. But over the next year to two years, this is an area that we're really going to be studying to see if there's a better path forward. So that's, that's showing the sequencing of what we go through on a specific detail. And we do that for all details of the home as to how we work on the path of continual improvement. So uh, I really appreciated the original question, which led to those first you know, 18 slides or whatever, because I wanted to show people that it's lineal thinking. You're, you're adapting and changing as you learn, right? It's not that you got to get to the end the first day. It's think it through and keep building on your knowledge and your successes. Okay, so we're at poll question number one stuff. And while you deal with this, I'm gonna grab a water. I'll be right Sounds back. good. Let me just move that here. All right, so I'm going to launch this poll and it's, uh, have you incorporated radon mitigation measures into your standard construction specification? So I gave you the opportunity to put multiple choice there uh, because uh, if you would like more information, uh, I've left that uh, space open for you. So we'll wait for Doug. Looks like responses are still coming in. Got almost everybody responding so far. And I will share those results. Uh, so it looks like uh, we've got uh, um, almost an equal number of people saying yes and no that they are re uh, dealing with your radon uh, mitigation measures. Um, a number, of, it's not applicable, so perhaps not builders, uh, but quite a few are interested in getting more information. So um, I will send you links um, to the KARST and to the CNRPP uh, websites for more information. Okay, what else do we have here? Do we have anything else? Oh, you have another one. Yeah. 
Another one. Okay, is that the basement wall? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we want to know what is your current basement wall detail. So it could be blanket. Um, it could be say framing and bat, a more traditional method. It could be a foam board with some framing and bat, mineral wall uh, with framing and bat, like Doug had talked about, a spray foam, uh, perhaps uh, panelized. And, um, and other, and for other, tell us in the chat. Now I see a couple of people have raised their hands just recently. So if you, uh, for those who raised your hands, uh, just send me a message in the chat and then I can, uh, I can answer you on that. Uh, ICF is uh, one that I just saw from, from uh, Mike in the chat. Um, Doug, while we're doing that, I've got a question for you. Is, um, is radon an issue with slab on grade versus basements? So it's not going to be as much of an issue with slab on grade because the issue with radon is it's a very, very dense gas and it's going to stay accumulated down in your basement space. When it's slab on grade with your doors opening and what have you, it's it's not. So the basement acts like a giant bowl or a bathtub, if you will, that's going to trap the moisture, or the, uh, the radon gas in there. A slab on grade doesn't typically do that. Now, unless it's, a, it's super, super high quantities, then it might be a bit of an issue. Certainly, if I was talking about schools or institutions where people are spending a lot of time and it's a large surface so it can actually get in into the centralized area and not dissipate, I would be more concerned than, say, a small bungalow, uh, like a tiny home or something like that, where it's slab on grade. So it is going to depend a little bit on the building type, but it, we're most concerned with basements because that's where it typically it migrates to. And the other thing is, is it's worse in the wintertime than summertime. And that's because of the, the frost cap, right? So the, the soil gas can't escape because it's naturally occurring everywhere. So it's going to mitigate, it's starting to migrate itself to the, the less pressure, which is the, the debasement, right? Which is why it shows up there and it's such a problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I suppose stack effect could create an effect, um, could, could enhance that uh, activity in the wintertime as well. Well, we do want to be careful of larger buildings because the, the, yeah. the lowest point in a larger building is often the elevator shaft bottom. Mm -hmm. And so it can actually get sucked up because of stack effect and end up throughout a large building. So if it was a high concentration of radon in a large building, we definitely would be wanting to deal with that as well. Exactly. So here's the results. Uh, so it looks like most people are using a foam, foam board of some form with uh, framing and bat, uh, followed by just a mix of uh, blanket and framing. And a few people have commented in the, in the chat with the type of uh, system that they have. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Very cool, excellent stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, next is windows. I promised I would get to windows today. So this is where I like to talk about with our design concepts, with, with windows especially, are we designing for human or are we designing for machine, okay? So the software stuff, it doesn't complain about comfort, does it? And I don't think I've ever in my experience as a builder, I've never yet had a phone call from a piece of software telling me that they're uncomfortable because they were too hot or too cold, right? So happy. <laughs> when, when we have, you know, folks say, well, you know, Woof is the best and it likes to have lots of heat gain in the windows. Stop, stop it. Let's design for the occupant comfort and let's make sure that they're comfortable because then your phone doesn't ring, right? Humans complain about comfort, machines don't. So, there's three kinds of energy loss that are affecting our windows, right? You've got radiant, which is can be controlled by solar heat gain coefficient. You've got convection loss, that's the I feel the draft. And then you've got conduction loss. And that's that's where the cold surface is pulling energy away from you, okay? That you're sitting close to the cold surface and it's sucking energy away from you. Or the best analogy I've got is when you're standing on that cold basement floor, right? So most windows in Canada are rated using energy rating or ER. These windows are subject to uncontrolled solar gains. They have draft issues caused by that convection loop. They've got conduction loss and a host of other challenges because the energy rating means that the actual window isn't as good at performing as it, as it should in my mind be. So on the left, this is a, a window I recently had a look at. It has the energy rating, which is down here in the, uh, the, the center left-hand side and it's got a 34 on it, okay? So, and then over here, it's got a U value of 1.71. So it's important to understand U value is the inversion of R value, okay? And then up top here on the Energy Star ratings, it's available in zone one, two, and three, okay? 
Now the window on the right, it says it doesn't qualify, right? It says it's only got an energy rating of 22 and it doesn't qualify. So Steph, which one do you think is the window I use? Well, I happen to know this answer. Uh, you would use the window on the right because it has the better U values, the lower the number, the better. And it also has a, a nice low solar heat gain. Exactly, exactly. So how do I get away with it? Well, I actually look at the, the tables and there is a link that you can find in SB12 that'll walk you through this. But effectively what we're looking at and saying you can use energy rating or U value. So even though the window says it's not rated for Canada, that's that's on Enercan's part, right? And, and bear in mind, the group with Enercan that I work like Patrick and that sort of thing, these guys have got it dialed in. The folks over at the window group, they got a lot of explaining to do, okay? And they, they are not getting it. And I keep hammering away at them and eventually they're gonna understand. But in the Ontario code, we got a workaround because of this. So what we really wanna do is stop worrying about whether it's got these zones in a high energy rating, which is gonna get us into trouble and start looking at U value and solar heat gain coefficient, right? So if we do that, then we're going to be able to get ourselves into buying better windows, okay? Why is the solar heat gain coefficient important? Because that's measuring the amount of heat energy that's coming through radiant energy that's going to impact on the home. The higher that number is, the more heat gain you're going to have and the hotter it's going to be with uncontrolled heat gain. Okay, so we actually really want to have a lower number. But when would you maybe want uh, to look at using an energy rating versus a U value? Is there any circumstance for that? Well, I don't really know. I'd say if the window never gets sun on it, you'd probably want U value because energy rating isn't going to help you at all, right? If it gets too much sun on it, you need to use U value with a low solar heat gain coefficient. West is especially a problem, right? But if you do happen to have the ability to have solar gain in the winter time with the right amount of overhang, so you're not getting too much shoulder season excess heating, then perhaps you could look at energy raising. Uh, but I'd say you should still have a good U value. And the problem is, is they kind of work in inverse. So it's hard to get a window with a high energy rating and a low U value because they impact themselves differently. So what do we do and what would I recommend? Well, as a production builder for above grade, I pick the window on, uh, on the right hand side every time. So the one that says it doesn't qualify is the one I use all the time. And the reason for that is, is because if I was trying to do it just by orientation and only picking the windows where I knew I had to have it because I had a problem, that's just being mean to your framers. You, you know, they've got to figure out what, what, what four by four window goes where? Oh man, that's, you're asking for problems, right? And then you end up with the wrong window in the wrong spot. And how do you fix that once it's foamed in place, right? So over a period of time, we just decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try and get our U value under 1.4 and we're gonna get our, our solar heat gain coefficient under 0.3. And if you pick that as a spec, you're gonna have pretty good performance, right? And that's gonna be a pretty good performance for almost everywhere you go. Now, uh, people have asked, well, how does that affect if you see down at the bottom, the visual transmittance? Okay, well, it is a little bit less of a visual transmittance. So I probably would not put uh, those two different window types side by each, like on a corner of a house, because you will notice a slight difference. But if it's all of them the same, you won't be able to tell the difference. So it, just so that folks are knowing about that one as well. And the other one is, is depending on your region and your wind loads, you may want to check and make sure that separately the window qualifies for your wind loads. Okay. Doug, yes, you had a, a good question come in that I know is going to come up on the mechanical conversation that you have, but I just wanted to uh, bring it to your attention. As the question was, um, as we are a heating dominated client climate, don't we need more solar energy? Uh, yes and no. So yes, we're a heating dominated climate, but we are in many regions starting to move to more of a cooling uh, climate that has to be considered. And the problem is, is as soon as you start looking at including cooling, it is dominating your HVAC design loads and sizing. So we are going to get into that later on because it's important, but, but keep your powder dry and we'll come back to that one. Okay. So I'm going to go back and say, remember Goldilocks? I think that was back in the first session. And I'm not going to talk about her, her psychological problems today. We've, we've covered that, but she doesn't like drafts, right? She doesn't like being overheated or too cold. She's not a cyborg, Steph. That was a little girl way back in the day. So my answer to this is, or my, my comment to this is don't design for cyborgs. 
or computer software. Right. So next, we're going to move on to HVAC. So that, that comment was very, very timely. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine named Jennifer Weatherston, who I've known for a lot of years. Jennifer is the current chair of the CHVA Net Zero Council. She is also a very experienced builder of production and custom homes. And many, many times I've called her to commiserate and say, how are you handling this? What do you think about that? And vice versa. She is an industry presenter on numerous subjects. She is an advocate for right size load load mechanicals. And she recently took a position as VP of operations at my company replacing me. So I'm pretty stoked to have uh, Jennifer join us for uh, a good while here today in conversation with Jennifer Weatherston. Hi, Jen. How are you, Doug? I'm good. It's glad to have you on board here, man. Thank you so much. And uh, I know we're working you hard here at DTL, but I'm glad you took a little <laughs> time out to, to, to stay with us with me. We, folks, we had this arranged way before we got that uh, other deal finalized. So pretty excited to have you here. So mechanicals, there's really four systems we want to look at that are all fairly common to all homes or the need to deal with them in all homes. Uh, you have to heat it, you have to cool it, you need to ventilate it, and you need to manage your moisture or humidity levels. So first off, we're going to talk about heating and cooling. So Jen, I know we've talked about this one many times, right, about CSA F280 and the need for getting our sizing right. Uh, we personally had a model home we couldn't balance because it was actually around 30,000 BTUs of, of uh, heat load it needed. And we had a 75,000 BTU furnace in because that's what we were using at the time. Uh, I call that the hot and cold dance. You know, I'm hot and cold, I'm hot, I'm cold. Yep. What's your experience been with uh, with dealing with that? Uh, quite often it's mechanical contractors not understanding the needs of the home when it becomes super airtight and specking equipment that is way too large. It's also um, sometimes from a mechanical design perspective, they're not using the right uh, parameters to be put in. So your air change being lower, your glazing on your windows. So there's quite a bit of impact where they're actually specking the wrong kind of equipment or the wrong equipment or the equipment we need is not even available. And we've got mechanical uh, manufacturers who look at us like we're crazy for the low loads that we need um, and they don't have anything. And is that is that just because in in the industry it hasn't been addressed or or is like what do you think is driving that? I've got my own comment, but I just want to hear what your thoughts are. <laughs> oh, that one's a tough political one, isn't it? A little bit. As an yeah. industry, we have talked to, and I know a lot of the people that are probably on this uh, series have been in communication with those manufacturers, telling them we need better equipment, we need to address lower loads. Um, they have states that are in our same climate zone that are building very similar product to very similar standards and going through the exact same thing. So it's baffling that uh, there isn't equipment out there that is meeting the needs of the homes, most definitely. There are some that are trying and I mean, we've got a Canadian product that's working um, that we like, but it's a so challenge. I remember being on a call with Gord Cook one time years ago, uh, trying to address this issue when CSA F280 was changing. And we were on with all the big furnace manufacturers, Gord had made, made arrangements for this call. And so I'm explaining to them what our loads are. And there was absolute silence on the phone, right? And, and I finally said to Gord, I said, I think they hung up. And then finally <laughs> I hear this, you know, Southern Texas drawl going, <laughs> what y'all building up there, son, like stack towns or something? <laughs> like, oh, these are singles and two stories, man. Like you're not getting it. And it just, and then what we found afterwards is they did make the boxes smaller. So they could put more boxes on the truck. They didn't deal with the load part. It's no. like you missed the point, right? So they made more money because they could ship more. And I Great. think too, uh, even when you get into it being like you said about um, we're a heating dominant society that's actually becoming a cooling dominant area and having to address the tonnage of AC on a heating system that's a much lower load than your cooling and not having the equipment with the right fan coils in them is the next issue that we're going to be facing right soon as well. So we, we are going to cover that up in a little bit, but just since we're talking about it right now and it's already been raised once, uh, you relayed an experience to me that I've had happen on more than a few times. Um, 
where you, you ended up actually having to put in a much larger furnace than what was needed for heating specifically because of the cooling load. So maybe dive into that for half a sec. We're, we're gonna have a conversation. I've got slides to help us through this. So, but that's, that's an important one. So we had a house, it was about a 3000 square foot uh, bungalow with a finished lower level. And it had a lot of south facing glazing and we were using triples, but I believe the cooling load was calling for something like five ton. And the yeah. heating load was calling for a system that was below about a 45,000 BTU system. And we had to put in a uh, 100,000, I think it was BTU furnace in order to address the five ton cooling load because there was no 45,000 BTU furnace that had the fan coil size large enough to accommodate the cooling load. So your only hope in that circumstance at that point would be to look at something that modulates. Yes. Yeah, that, that's tough, man. It's not like you can add, you know, localized conditioners. Well, you could, you can actually maybe do it with many splits, but you're getting into a really complicated system then, right? Yeah. All right, next slide, what do we got? Okay, so furnace selection is really important. You just mentioned the Canadian manufacturer. We've been working with these guys for quite a few years. I know you've got quite a bit of experience with them as well. Uh, it's the Detson Chinook 30. So this is designed for lower load homes. And you know, I, I love working with Detson. I wish there was other manufacturers that were coming to the table the, the way they were, because I think overall as an industry, it would be better for all of us, right? But this furnace right here will deliver between 12 and 30,000 BTUs. And guys, it's the size of a large suitcase. Like it's tiny, right? Um, it's also an alternative to water-based heat. And I, I've had some circumstances, and, and maybe I'll ask you to, to speak to that, where we've done water-based heat in order to get the right sizing of loads. But as soon as you're into a hard water situation, it becomes a real challenge in a hurry. I blew out a water heater in four months in one, one instance. That's quite common, I think, too, for a lot of areas in Ontario. But also when you look at the simplicity of it for a homeowner and how they relate to the operation of it, uh, we often talk about automobile manufacturers and the simplicity of them. And when you get into your car, the driver and the passenger both have control of their thermostat. And when they get into their house, they don't understand why they have a system that is not telling them when to change the filter or dampering and adjusting to the needs of them as well. So. I think the buyers today don't have a lot of free time and to put in a mechanical system that's complicated as a builder, you're only asking for trouble. So your warranty guy takes it on the back end, right? Because they've got to then deal with the client that didn't understand what they were getting and, or you've got performance issues because of oversizing. Okay. Cooling load. So typical air conditioners are normally oversized in the needs of the home. This leads to what we call uh, the cooling short cycling or as I like to say, uh, with these lots of short run times over the cooling period, because you keep hitting the thermostat set point, in order to resolve the humidity level and get the a home to feel more comfortable, I call it you're chasing cold and clammy. And the worst thing you really can do is keep setting that thermostat down to try and deal with that, because all you're gonna do with an oversized system is make your basement a meat locker, right? So one of the things that we found out and why we started including air conditioning in all of our homes is because we had so many complaints in the summertime every year when the, the homeowner would call and say, I'm working with my HVAC guy and he says these ducts are way too small. And it gets really hard to say, no, your HVAC guy needs to go back to school because he's not learned the new CSA of 280. So we solved it by just including the air conditioner and, and killing the conversation. But what, what was your experience with that situation? What we ended up doing is we went with the hybrid uh, approach. So we did the heat pumps. So that allowed us to offer the cooling in the summertime, but also to pick up the heat in the shoulder season um, to drive kind of an overall hybrid performance system that was optimizing the fuel rates in Ontario. Nice okay, and simple. Cool. And we're gonna we're gonna do an actual slide on that at some point in in the uh, upcoming slides here. So how do we remedy this? Well, we wanna reduce our solar gain. So back to the windows, you know, I, I, I'll keep hammering the drum on the windows because it impacts on so many different things that you gotta get the windows under control. And then right size cooling. The, the HVAC contractor and the, the heat loss heat gain designer really gotta know what they're doing. So air source heat pump, you just mentioned it. Do they work in Canada? Yes, they do. In fact, we've even got cold climates ones if you really wanna get going on it. 
in this particular case, we're looking at mini split technology. So anybody, if you've been down south and you've you know been in air conditioned space and you look at the side of the building and they've got a little unit running that looks like this, it's the same technology. What we've done is just put in uh, the compressor into our, our duct system. So we basically, you know, made a hot rod, right? But it's uh, it's getting pretty common. And you've, you've just alluded to, you've got a fair bit of experience doing this, right? Yeah, they're a great little system and they're super small and they're super quiet uh, super when you quiet. get into these homes. So you the can put them thing, in side yards. Perfect, yes. I was gonna say, if you had experience putting them in the side yards, we actually got our municipality to allow us to put them in side yards because the, the, the noise was uh, decibel wise down to a level that would be permissible. And you don't get that <clears throat> clunk as they turn on, right? And We've they, put them on uh, mid-rise on balconies too. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. There, there wouldn't really be any issue whatsoever. And, and Steph's off screen, but Steph, if you do see a question you wanna jump in on us with, then uh, have at it, okay? Yeah, absolutely. We otherwise we we're just going to keep having a chat here, right? Hopefully, folks yeah. are getting a bit out of it. Can you hear me? Yes, you could turn up a bit though. Oh, uh, okay. That will require a little bit of uh, technical. That's, that's uh, so better. Give me a moment. Okay. That's, that's better. Okay. She probably add. Oh, go ahead. Oh, we did have a couple of questions that came in, so I could uh, throw them your way. One uh, is with regards to. Um, Let's see here. Well, actually, maybe more of a comment. A high solar heat gain windows need exterior operable shading devices. Are you finding that with high solar heat gain windows? <laughs> Don't put high solar heat gain windows in. <laughs> That's rule number one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I already said it. Like, if you're going to have it on the south facing, you're going to have to have some type of overhang to cover it. That's the only way you can get away with it in a high performance home. It, it's just. You know, and there's going to be guys that are going to disagree with their philosophy on how to do design, but it just leads to nightmares, right? So if you're going to do it, you've, you've got to really, and there's a great calculator. Uh, I think it's from Berkeley where you can actually do a calculation of your overhangs and, and stuff. I'll dig that out and I'll make sure that you get it for your, for your comments. It's a little free piece of software, but you can very quickly run your overhang analysis to see uh, what the impact is of, of uh, on the windows and then you'll know whether or not you should do high solar heat gain windows in an orientation we used to use that for planning when to put the windows in where uh, it's just it's it's not that you can't figure it out it's that the guys in the field have to figure it out and that's where the big problem comes right mm -hmm. especially Robert, in, go ahead oh i was gonna say robert bean um in his course offered up one and i'm not sure if that's the same calculator but you put your window specs in and it shows the person standing in the room and the impact of what that window does to their comfort zone no that's ashray 55 we covered that in the first session uh and, and that's a really cool calculator because it'll tell you wow this guy is now cooking and he's not comfortable because he's 28 in in his room and i'm talking celsius here uh, that that's a separate one, and, and we've already shared that, which is a fantastic calculator as well, right? Yeah. So it we've still actually applies. Had, what's yeah, that? Yeah. Oh, it just still it still applies even here, yeah. right? Like absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why we started yeah. off with it with comfort, is because I wanted to get people thinking differently about comfort, right? All right, what do we got next? Yeah. Duct design. Oh, this is a good one. I like this one. Yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> So duct design thinking is really starting to change. And um, here's, here's my base analogy is I like to talk about carrying a bowl of water and in, in then that bowl, you can carry the water pretty well as long as you don't tip it on yourself, right? But if you were to take that same volume of water and put it into a colander, what happens? It's all gonna splash out, right? Because you wanna get to the good stuff, the pasta that's in the bowl, right? That's why you're using a colander in the first place. Well, that colander represents about 30% surface area leakage, right? which is roughly equivalent to our ducts, okay? So why is that important? Well, 30% area of leakage in our ducts means we need bigger ducts to get more air moving to where it needs to be. And it also means that we're not gonna have comfort, right? So you got bigger ducts that don't work as well. We did a lot of work. I'm sure you've done the same sort of thing. Taping, you know, and smack in the sea is the base standard. Uh, it's probably not quite good enough for what we really wanna get to. It'll get you down to about 10% if you're really, really paying attention on your details. Uh, the smart duct system I'm showing here is about 3% out of the out of the box, right? 
So maybe you want to do just a quick rundown of, of your experience with looking at smart ducting and why it's uh, a really cool system. I love the smart duct system. Um, and I wish more manufacturers had it because it allows you to take it up high in the wall. You don't have to worry about furniture being placed over it. You're getting a consistent throw of air and mixing within that space, which is creating a better quality of air for the people in the room, but also for comfort as long as you're not blowing their hair uh, while they're sitting on the couch or in bed. Uh, it's, just, it's an overall better mix of air. I actually worked with the Igabus, Igabus, Igabus lab down in Pittsburgh. Uh, and it wasn't because it was a season opener for the Steelers, which it was. Okay? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we worked on the throw device that you see here up in the uh, up in the right hand picture and which is coming out of the wall in the lower left hand picture. And, uh, you know, I, I gave some recommendations on what that should look like. And then they went and manufactured it or found a manufacturer that had it maybe. Uh, what I'm really finding from our trades, though, what they like about it is they, they say, you know, what, at the end of the day, I don't hurt as much because they're not lifting near as much tin. Right. So and when we look at it. Smaller loads means smaller ducks, right? And so most builders are doing, you know, maybe uh, an 18 by eight trunk primary. We're running three sixes, maybe a, an eight and two sixes and splitting them off, right? So there's a huge difference on what you can get away with if you just look at how you're doing your duct design, right? And you get less bulkheads because you've got less pipes running up in the corners as well as across the top of your ceiling. So you've got an increased ceiling height. Um, so that tray is no longer required. It's more a feature. And then the other thing is, is that you can get more of the ducts to run up in your floor joist assembly as well, right? Your, your, your trunks, I should say. And the ducts themselves uh, are a lot easier to fit up into the floor as well, which does clean up that ceiling quite a bit in the basement. It really comes down to a couple of critical points though. Um, if we can reduce our, our duct leakage and we can reduce our solar gains, we can really go after smaller ducts, right? And that's when the smart ducting really starts to play a great advantage. Okay, return air is important too, right? So I often give the analogy that if you've got a, a bowl or a glass of water, you can only put so much water in and then it's, it spills out because it's not got any place else to go. But if you drill a, a hole in the bottom of the water, it'll go almost forever if it's equal in to equal out, right? Well, you know, return air in a room plays that very role. It's the, it's the hole in the bottom of the glass, which will allow air to get out of the room so, so conditioned air can get in. Um, I've often been told hot air rises. And back with the smart talking, people say, but Doug, hot air rises. I say, I know, but this is about throw because we want to throw it across the room and let it mix. And it's a much better mix than if you just do it off the floor. So conversely, with, with the hot air rising, well, isn't that the best spot to put your return air then up top? You think? What, what would you do? It's, it's, there's some physics going on there, right? Yeah. I don't know. Where would you put it? Well, I would probably consider actually ducting it and doing that high for the heat and low for the cooling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we haven't got to the ducting it yet part. That's on that's on your task list for next year. <laughs> no pressure. Because it solves a couple of other problems that I'd really like to get away get away from. But yeah. Uh, up high is the return for upstairs and down low is the return in the basement and it really resolves a lot of problems. Okay, design loads. Well, this is where people can get into a lot of difficulty, especially as builders, because we're not really trained in this. So we don't know what to look for. And this is where we get into problems because when you look at say, um, what are they installing into the software? What are they entering into the software? A lot of times they'll say, well, it's very tight. Well, that's about three air changes per hour, right? How big of a hey, hole do you want in your new home? <laughs> yeah, okay, but we're building that one or one and a half and you're putting in three. That's a huge difference. I showed that in the previous session, right? So it's important to consider a couple of things. One is, is room by room design makes a lot of sense because then you can test and you cannot test if you don't know your room by room, right? You're basically guessing what the HVAC design is going to be. And it's kind of like sizing your air conditioner like this, right? Uh, designing for unfinished basements makes a lot of sense as well because then when the client finishes it, you don't get the problem called back again later about, oh, it's in the wrong spot and I really wish it wasn't here and I don't have enough heat into this room and what do I do, right? Um, so it's important that we get that considered. And then the last real trick of the trade, Jen, and, and I don't know how much experience you've had with this, but 
I've had to go back and review. Sometimes they'll use Hot 2000 to look at their right soft outputs uh, to say, no, you've got this wrong. You haven't considered the window calculation, uh, but we need to get this down, right? And so this, the solar gain is important, but so is your, your air leakage. And that's why in the first session and second session, we've already talked about air leakage, right? So what, what's been your experience with working with your duct desire, your, your air, heat loss, heat gain uh, design? So I don't have the background that you have. I didn't actually get certified in it to be able to do my own. So but you're smarter than me. As, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> once you go through enough plans enough times and look at the drawings i mean you can start to figure it out on your own then you start to understand that who's paying attention to what you're putting in um, there are numerous times where we've gone back and talked to the designers about the glazing that they've put in the spec the orientation that they've got the house sitting at and um, the leakage that they've allowed for and that the specs that they had were incorrect uh, we're shifting the house just slightly in the orientation alone changed the metrics considerably so i mean as a builder going back and paying attention to those became critical that would be the one thing i would say you don't want a generic design for right it really needs to be site site by site specific i remember i was helping one builder out in alberta and his challenge was as the hvac contractor and it was only less than a three thousand square foot house was putting two furnaces into that home and I'm like, oh my, what are you? Wow, he must be enjoying that golf trip or something because I don't know what's going on there. I, I go I've back and read that. the CSA 280, right? You've yeah. seen it too, right? I have, but it's been because of the cooling yeah. where they had something like seven tons of cooling because it was south facing with floor to ceiling glazing and the heating loads were low and it was low solar heat gain glass, but they had to split it off and to two separate mechanical systems specifically for that because it was the size of the AC was ridiculous or the heat pump was ridiculous. And that's where, you know, zoning can help, but it's not necessarily a panacea either. If you've got excess load, you've got to deal with that load, right? Yeah. Okay. The case for modulation, you know, this movie. <laughs> it's an entertaining one. <laughs> it's an entertaining one. They were having a ton of fun when they were going to Vegas, right? Well, I consider that to be a lot like modulation. It's just like having a blast cruising down the highway, having a lot of fun with the wind in your hair, right? Uh, that's, that's just, that's how I remember modulation is so cool, right? So why is this good? Well, it has a slow ramp up, it has a slow ramp down, and then it has these long continuous run times. And that's the part that's like being out on the highway, right? When you get into stop and go traffic, or if you have overshoots because you're doing, say, a single stage, that's when you start getting into comfort issues. And what we really want to do is look at what modulation can do to help with, see the smiling, happy faces? That's what we want. We want our customers to be happy, right? And modulation really goes a long way to helping that, especially when you've got something where you want to be able to maintain a temperature and have it continuous because then you can get all the rooms to have the same amount of airflow into them and, and really create a more comfortable environment. So you've done a, a, probably as much or more work on modulation than, than I have. So what's your thoughts on this one? Uh, I'd like to ask people if they in, prefer to breathe continuously or intermittently. Um, I personally prefer to breathe consistently and constantly um, and that's kind of like modulation is for a system I mean you're constantly delivering that fresh air and that mixing um, at a lower speed that's much more energy efficient so why would you want a two stage or a single stage when you can have the premium of air delivery through modulation and constant comfort and also modulation uh, when it can go varying degrees of, of delivery might be your only answer when you do have an oversizing situation, right? It's, it's it can really save your your bacon, right? Yeah, it's delivering okay. to that last um, that last room in the house at the end of the the line. The room over the garage, right? That's usually the toughest one, right? Uh, if you're going to install solar panels, this is our newest model home, uh, the Dunmore, and uh, it's an Etzer home. The panels are on it; you just can't see them from this from this photo, but it's got this really funky furnace in it. Now, you know, I've been offline for a while, so I, I didn't, I knew they were doing it, but I hadn't been able to see it until just the other day. It is the Detson Supreme. So this is an electric furnace, right? 
And my understanding is this thing, uh, the, the Supreme is 100% modulating. That's from zero to like 100, right? It goes down to like 15,000 BTU, I think. Yeah, very, very low. So, I mean, that's incredible, right? Just incredible. I was really, really pumped to see this. And especially when we start thinking about when you have air conditioning uh, combined with your, your furnace, if you can get that electric to the electric, now you've got 3,000 to say 30,000 with solar being the primary for delivery of your energy. It gets your net, net metering kind of more in balance. So I look at this as what's called a transitional technology. You've been doing this probably as long or longer than I have. Although I, th I think we may have actually hit on this thought relatively the same amount of time in two completely different <laughs> markets. And went, whoa, wait a minute, I've seen that, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think about being able to go from three to 30 and how it impacts on the shoulder seasons though? It's, it's interesting, right? Like you, to be able to do that, it offers buyers a new opportunity in the level of comfort right because when you're in heat pump mode it's electric so it's a different kind of comfort and that's kind of why i've liked the hybrid for so long is because gas offers a warmer temperature feeling to a buyer um, than the electric does you have to almost bump it up a little bit but from a cost effectiveness it's there's a, a set point where it makes more sense to transition over. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, but um, yeah, it's interesting to watch. Yeah. You know, on the subject of the gas and the dual fuel, because it, it is a really good transitional technology, at least it's starting to adjust the carbon footprint and you're very much so ready for going all electric down the road, right? You, you may have to put in, uh, you know, a larger cold climate air source heat pump, but you can get there, right? But I, I do know that it was about two winters ago that our, our uh, at the time, 11 year old home, our, our furnace pooched, right? And we couldn't get parts for it anymore because it was a, a custom design electric base, or sorry, water based uh, air handler. And so it was running off of a boiler, that sort of thing. And so I, I said, to heck with it, money where the mouth is and putting the Datsun system in because that's what I use for my customers. And we put it in and, you know, they were doing it, I think, on a late November day. So, you know, similar to this, it was pretty cold. And so Carolyn walks into a really cold house and, and after a couple hours, she's like, I can't believe how quickly it heated the home. And after about a week, she says, I can't believe how comfortable this is. Like, we don't even have the, the duvet on anymore. I'm like, <laughs> I know, right? We had 11 years of like freezing and now it's like this, right? So there's a lot to be said for, for gas. And what I'm really excited about with the electric at a high performance level is, is I think the performance is gonna get a lot closer, right? Yeah. So we're, I'm really looking forward to working on this project with you here, right? Yeah, the carbon's an interesting piece. I think from the gas side, I, I mean, when you look at high performance homes and how airtight they are, gas still is an 87% reduction in operational carbon. So for a transitional i think it does make sense but i mean you and i both know that that is going to be changing very soon and we're going to be testing out different technology absolutely right and we're going to get to that in half a second here but for folks that really are going what are these two talking about and how do i figure this out the good news is is that uh, leap and uh, in the other case leap and canmet have put a lot of effort into this. And I know I've, I've been involved with it. Uh, the folks at Building Knowledge has been involved with it. You've done work on it. There's been a lot of folks in the industry that have really vetted these two documents quite well. The first is uh, Master Planning and Decision Guide for Natural Gas Mechanical Systems. And that's really gonna help you to get your head wrapped around the dual fuel part. And then the second one is the Zoning Duct Design Guide. And that's gonna talk you through things like, well, okay, can I do interior wall, high throw, things like that, and, and get away from, it has to be under the window every time. No, no, they don't. <laughs> you do not have to put a supply air underneath every window and in front of, you know the spot where you step through the door and you've got the supply air grill right there and you step on it and it's so annoying. Racks every to, time. <laughs> you don't have to do that, right? Well, you hmm. get into zoning too of uh, different levels too in the home, right? Um, yeah, exactly. exactly. Bedroom separate or basements one level, main floors the other. Or if you, because you don't want to be playing with the thermostat and changing the temperature in these homes, otherwise you're consuming more energy. So if uh, somebody wants their room cold when they sleep at night, then just put a zone 
in there, segregated off, and uh, Bob's your uncle. We actually did one really large home where the, the, the occupant did want to have that. And so we actually solved that by putting a mini split in rather than having, you know, the extra ducting and that sort of thing, because it was only just for that one room space area, right? So it was a bit of a novel uh, approach to it, but it, it, did, it did work in the long run, right? So Steph's going to make sure that everybody gets uh, copies of these so that they can have a peek at, at what's, uh, what's coming their way and get some resources available to them. Uh, next, I think, is yes, the future. We are really fortunate to have uh, our sponsor, Enbridge, be such a forward-thinking company. And uh, we've had uh, meetings with them over the last little while about looking at geothermal from their perspective, which is effectively they're saying, hey, if we've got to run a gas pipe and gas is going to be going down, maybe we should, as a distributor, look at offering geothermal. So what's really cool is in their program here, they're actually looking at um, taking the capital cost so that the occupant is just paying a, a monthly fee, the same as they would if they were getting natural gas anyway. Um, really cool technology, eh? I know in the past, we've always shied away from geothermal, especially on a single family or townhome development, but over, the, I would say, especially the last two years, the technology has greatly changed and the ramp up speed and the energy consumed is a lot less than what it used to be. So it's become an option now that makes a lot of sense in a community scale. Yeah, and we're going to be doing a pilot. I think it's going to start in January. So we'll be doing a deliverable on that in uh, probably fall, I think, on just a one off so we can debug it. But we're also looking at our next set of apartment units that we're, we're seriously having conversations about doing this. So um, I'm, I'm really glad I got somebody to hand that off to. <laughs> knows that, that bit real well, right? So uh, I, I really like this concept, though, because you know the upfront cost for a consumer on their mortgage makes it almost prohibitive to do. And if we're able to take that upfront cost and spread it out or amortize it over the period of time so that they're not getting hit with well, let's face it, you're, you're, you know, the, the wonderful beauty of having a high performance home is it's higher value. It means you pay more in taxes, both on the GHST uh, and also on your annual uh, property tax, which is not really fair in my mind. And we've been fighting against that for quite a while. So being able to amortize this off book, if effectively, if you will, uh, I think is, is really got some potential to it. And I'm really excited about looking forward onto this. So what else have we got here? So how did this program works is there's no cost to the builder, that'd be us for loop infrastructure that brings the installed system cost back in range with the cold climate air source heat pump. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, it's a lease agreement signed by the homeowner with the builder's agreement and purchase and sale. So it's a sub set agreement or a schedule uh, similar to what you do with your water heater. It's a 20 year uh, with a 20, 20 year renewal. So it's also got a 40 year buyout option uh, the loop contract includes installation, commissioning, maintenance, repairs, and replacement if and when the loop uh, or a new loop is required. So that that is uh, pretty cool. And I understand in talking with them when we had that meeting that the, the monthly fee will depend on your tonnage size. So they're still working out the final details on that, but a bigger home pays more, right? It makes more, it makes sense, right? It also, it, yeah, it also makes sense that it's trying to uh, reward better performance as well because your, your tonnage is down. So it's, it's kind of a really cool win-win. Now, uh, when we looked at this slide the other day, you did note that, that this is a horizontal loop and that's great if you've got, you know, a couple of acres, acres but it's going to go vertical in subdivision settings, right? Yeah. Yeah. It would have to. And I know that, um, some of our concerns were about infill lots and, uh, yeah. that's a, a, something that we'll work out with Enbridge or um, the drillers when we go forward. But um, we're also working out the bugs on using conventional equipment to tie into the ground source heat pumps as well, so. Yeah, because we really don't want to give up in the smart ducting, right? No. no, no. Steph, we're up on a question. Okay. Uh, and we have a few questions that have come in. So let me just start with this poll first. Okay. How are we doing, Steph? Are we okay time-wise? Feels like we we're are okay. Yeah, yeah, we're at 2.09, so uh, we, uh, we're doing pretty good. So I'm going to launch this poll here. You should see it now. What heating and or cooling system are you currently using? And I've given you the option to um, pick multiple choices there. So whether it's gas or electricity, hybrid, 
geothermal water or other, let us know in the chat. So while uh, people are answering that, um, here's a few questions for you. So what is the um, upfront cost approximately for a geothermal uh, system for 3,000 square foot home? Oh, it's been a long time since I've costed one out. You're probably in the 25 to 35,000 range for probably 30,000, I would say. Probably a bit more than that. I know it's that- It's gonna what, depend on vertical versus horizontal loop too though, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Vert vertical loop has more upfront cost. Uh, another question uh, came in that was, have you or Jen uh, used high velocity heating systems yet? Uh, similar duct to, uh, ducts to the low velocity and are the same and, and has the same mixing principles. So have you used high velocity uh, heating Run systems? away from fear of it. So the mm. answer would be no? I, I, you would not convince me to do that. The system that we're showing is mid velocity, by the way. So it, it'll vacillate between uh, on high speed, it would be mid velocity. Typically it's running on low speed because it's close to continuous, right? Okay, I'll put in another question here and then I'll show the results from the poll. Um, let's see here. Could we avoid the need for overhangs if we use radiant cooling floors to absorb the solar gain when that's an issue, then we'd gain the benefit of the heat gain at cooler times of the year? Uh, <laughs> my, you want, my thought is, is you can't control how quickly that comes in or out. Um, so for basements, I always looked at it as you could put radiant in and it is more comfortable underneath your feet. And if you have a party and everybody's in the basement, you can't cool that floor fast enough for all of the people in that space generating heat. But if it's zoned, you can immediately flip over to AC mode and cool the occupants in that space. So I'm usually more inclined to go with the more cost effective and um, solution that I have control over as opposed to something I can't immediately change. That's well, how I would view it. So the, the challenge with that is that you're talking about, like Jen said, an intermittent load, right? So it's now three o'clock in the afternoon and you know you've got it for three hours, but for the other 21 hours, that home is gonna be being cooled maybe abnormally high because it takes a long time for that thermal mass to go up or down, right? Uh, abnormally high because you're trying to deal with that three hour window of, of heat gain, right? It, it's really tough. And I agree, like I, I'm a big advocate for sub slab insulation and not that often do we do in floor heating because it just, in my mind, it's not needed. You get the vast majority of the benefit by putting a couple of inches or an R10 of, of foam under the slab or whatever your insulation choice is that works, right? Okay, so thank you. Um, uh, what we'll do is uh, we can come back to those questions a little bit uh, later once you're done. Um, so what we've seen here is that the majority of people are using uh, gas for their heating and cooling system with electricity in second place. And uh, let's see here, boiler, uh, propane boilers in some instances are being used. Um, the Mitsubishi air source heat pump, Heating with water, rental, gas, hot water tank, electric, electric uh, air conditioning, and one is an oil-based heating system. So there's so there's some folks doing some different stuff out there. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good mix. Yeah, and some hybrid, some geothermal, some water in there as well. So if we had a second question here. I think that's the last one. Ventilation. We're on to ventilation, and we've got about 17 minutes. So let's see if I can make this work, okay? So, anybody seen the Blues Brothers? You know what they say when they're at the bar? They says, well, what type of music do you have here? And she responds back, she says, Jen, you know what she says? She says, well, we've got both kinds. We've got country and Western. <laughs> now, the link is here, go watch it, you know, folks, because it, it's, it's an awesome movie. It's one of my favorites, but that scene, when I think of ventilation, that's how I remember, we've got both kinds. So what do we got? Well, we've got both kinds. We've got windows that open and we have a fresh air machine, right? Same, same, right? We've Except one kinds. actually though is, makes it easier to breathe if you have allergies to the outdoors or asthma. Yes, and I often say to my customers, you can have those windows open whenever you want, 
but there's going to be lots of times when you have to have them closed. And the wonderful thing about the fresh air machine is it actually goes through your furnace filtration, right? So it takes bulk particulate out before it goes through your, your, uh, your core. And then it also has the, the additional filtration. So yes, people with allergies, it's a wonderful, wonderful solution. Um, I just, I really like them. They're great. <laughs> So goes back to, do you like to breathe in your home? <laughs> when would you like fresh air? I ask people that all the time. When would you like fresh air? Well, I, I like it on Sundays in the summertime. What? <laughs> no, man, you want fresh air all the time. That's the only answer. When would you like fresh air? All the time. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, more and more of our customers have been getting that one right. So your fresh air machine provides your home, uh, provides your home with continuous fresh air, helps remove moisture and odors, and also cleans the air, too. Uh, the ARV is designed running on low continuous speed basis, offering 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off, or as we like to call, smart mode, right? And this is fairly close, but not perfectly set it and forget it, because there are times when you've got an, an additional occupant load, you might have to run it on high. Uh, especially now in the time of COVID, ventilation is becoming increasingly important. And getting, you know, a bigger circulation of fresh air when you have a couple of guests in your home is a really great idea. And this is something that, that a, an ERV can do. So it's not just about opening the windows in the wintertime and freezing because you got a, a company. You can actually use this machine on high to help get more fresh air, right? Um, so really a good system. And any comments on that? I don't even remember which one you guys were using when, uh, when we last spoke. Um, we've been going between the Venmar and the Vandy. So basically the same. Um, I think the only thing that we've had to do is basically threaten homeowners that if you unplug it, we'll void your warranty. There Don't you turn go. it That's off. A, just, just leave it on. <laughs> set it and forget it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, you know, sometimes my wife, she likes to have the windows open, even though the machine's running, cause she just likes that fresh air and you know, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. As long as the fireplace isn't on at the same time. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, I just wanted to point out before folks ask, the, the plywood in behind here is, uh, it's about perspective. This is actually quite a few feet away from the wall. It just doesn't show that way in the slide. So I think that there is the, uh, some gas works on the wall at that point there. This is not wall mounted, it's hung. You can see, you can see the, the chains. It, so it's, it's hanging from the floor assembly, right? Humidity control, this is the bane of my existence. And we have different perspective on this for, from our experiences. So it's, it's interesting. And we were talking the other day about, you know, how you get used to being down here where we are in the banana belt and there is a lot of humidity drive because of these two great lakes around us. Right. So uh, as I like to say, it's, it's not the heat, it is uh, the humidity. And so what I'm finding is humidity levels in high performance home can really vary. And what I really do like about using say an, an, an ERV is that it's going to help with uh, both winter and summertime. So when the client moves in, and, and I want you to comment on this, their perspective is things are going to be like their previous home and the home is different, right? So, you know, if you've ever, you know, wanted to shock somebody, uh, you, you get on the carpet and you rub your foot and you go and you give them an electric shock. That doesn't happen so much anymore because typically the homes are a little bit more humidity balanced with using an ERV. An HRV, we've gotten ourselves into problems quite a few times. With, uh, with controlling winter humidity. In fact, we, we measured one home, and this is before we switched to the ERB. We were down to 10% humidity in that house. Wow. Like, that is... that's insane. Like, that, the, the clients were actually complaining about nosebleeds is how we figured that there was a problem, right? I was going to say that's not good health-wise. Uh, no. no, no, no. I think um, he said we had similar, we didn't have humidity. We had, um, the houses were dry. And yeah. we had to start putting humidifiers in because once the initial build settled and we were using, we went from uh, same thing, HRVs and now ERVs and firm believer that that was probably one of the best decisions. So we, we have, uh, we've pretty much managed our wintertime humidity by, by doing that. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, the recommended range is going to be about 35 to 50%. And I think I do got a slide coming up on this. The, the issue for me, though, is that like 35% relative humidity with double pane glass can still get you into trouble, right? Because if you actually measure the relative humidity directly on the glass, it's probably going to be higher than that. 
And so we, we actually have uh, found that by having, by having triple pane and the better insulative quality, we're able to manage a higher humidity level with less issues and, and greater comfort, right? Yeah. So we're, we're now seeing that, you know, 40 to even 45 is achievable uh, safely in our climate zone where we are uh, with using with using a triple window. So that's the interconnection, right? Nice. Yeah. The summer, the summer humidity, uh, what we've been finding is that the, where we really see challenges is summer and shoulder seasons, but for different reasons. Summer, it's just such a super high dump load of humidity. And the challenge is, is that you still want fresh air, so your ERV is running, right? Um, in the spring and the fall, your, your house is going, am I hot? Am I cold? I'm hot in the morning, I'm cold in the afternoon, whatever, and vice versa. I don't know what I'm doing, right? And so your systems aren't running consistently, and that's where we start to see the other problems for about four to six weeks and around April and around October. So just maybe a quick comment on what you've been doing in your, your history on trying to manage the intermittent humidity loads that are happening. Um, very similar circumstances. So the ERV and the system running constantly. I've, I've never been a fan of doubles with the different glazing. We've always stuck with triples and um, the 366 glazing. So that's, I don't know, that was always my, if we change anything, it's definitely not going to be the windows. Like that was the, the sacred cow because it yeah. has such an impact on so many different areas of a high performance home that uh, I didn't want to give that one up. So we didn't have a lot of issues that way. It was more drying out once the home got going and um, once you got through the initial couple couple months. I'm going to make a follow up comment right at the very end on, on that specific point. What I have found though is that trying to guide occupants through managing their humidity levels, especially these intermittent loads when they think, I've got my ERV, it's supposed to dry my home out. Well, 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 no, it's supposed to ventilate your home. It might help at certain times with humidity loads, especially for overdry in the wintertime. But the, the ERV is there to manage your ventilation, to give you fresh air. That's its number one job, right? The, the one thing I say to occupants is, you know, really, if you're finding that you're struggling a little bit with humidity, get an Energy Star rated uh, dehumidifier pipe it right directly to a drain and put it on 50% and let it run all the time. I never liked the bucket version because you always forget to empty the bucket and it's not working 80% of the time, right? So it's better to have a direct drain. However, we are seeing the odd outlier house now. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get to that slide next, but this is the reference table I was just mentioning. It's from a gentleman by the name of Jan Eeks, very nice man. I've, I've gotten to spend some time with him over the years. And I think you have it at the, it's spring training as well. So this is actually lifted right from Jan's website and it talks us through what humidity levels relatively should be speaking internal to external based on outside temperatures. The issue that's really cool about this is that, um, as I said, you can get, because if you're looking at minus 30, it's talking about 15% relative humidity. That's really, really dry, right? And you can get a better overall humidity level higher than this if, you, if you're using the triples like you just mentioned, right? So that's really important because 35 to 55 or even 40 to 55 is really the ideal range for also not just comfort, but controlling bacteria, viruses, things like that, and giving the occupant a greater amount of safety. And so in the time of COVID, you know, maybe we should consider that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a plug for ERVs and why they matter. All ERVs are HRVs. No HRV is an ERV. They are not the same animal. An ERV, uh, sorry, an HRV will deal with, with heat, right? Exchange, it's a heat exchange. And it'll be in anywhere from the 70 to 80% in, in efficiency of, of gaining the heat. So it's throwing out stale air and bringing in fresh air. They cross by each other and then they, they change energy, right? Uh, an ERV does that, but it also does the same thing with the second source of energy, which is, which is latent or moisture, right? So there's sensible and then there's the, the latent and we want to deal with both loads. And so that's what the ERV does. And what I really like is that the, it gets away from overwetting as much. It doesn't solve it. It gets away from it as much in the summertime and it really helps with over drying in, in, in the wintertime. So if you as a builder are in a, a climate where you, you maybe should be considering this, especially with a high summertime humidity dump, you should really be looking at an ERV instead, right? 
Uh, but we have had a couple of outliers that we're dealing with uh, as far as, as um, homes go. And so one of the things we're looking at doing now is a retrofit on a couple of homes that we just cannot get the humidities under control. And so what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're actually looking at a product called from Ultra Air. Uh, I think it's Santa Fe is the parent company, but this is an inline dehumidification system and it's sized based on the load for the home and the size of the home. Um, it can be roughed in to your, your return air system and really get after controlling that humidity. So it can work in parallel with, with your, D, your, D, sorry, your ERV system, right? Have you had much experience with any one of these? Not with dehumidification. Like I said, we've, uh, we were actually looking at adding humidification to some larger homes um, and not so much, but we weren't directly located between the lakes. So it seems geography definitely has an impact on that. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're maybe in that area, just a tiny bit higher as well, elevation wise. Right. So yeah. we tend to be a bit more down in the bowl and, and really get hammered with it here. Uh, one thing that I found over time, though, is when when looking at adding adding the moisture to the the home, um, there's there's one on the market, and the name escapes me. You might remember it, but it actually does it by creating a mist uh, as opposed to just water through a filter. The water through a filter is about twenty five percent percent effective, and the one that creates the mist is much higher. It's closer to one hundred percent effectiveness. Uh, I, I want to say April Air is the brand, but I'm not 100. I think you might be right. I know, like I've looked at a couple different systems in line, even ultraviolet, just with a yeah. based on the t sign of the times. But um, that sounds like it's familiar. Yeah, but certainly, folks, you you want to manage your humidity level, and and what my experience has been right now is that we're having to worry about dehumidifying, but. I've had, it, had to experience on, on humidifying as well. Uh, one really great thing to do on that as, as well that's very passive is when people are cooking, let the steam uh, go into the rooms and then continuous fan will help to, to move it around the home. Same with the showers, maybe don't run the shower fans quite as much. One thing I did miss on ventilation as well is the importance of spot ventilating uh, for bathrooms uh, to stop that circulation where you get into a, a kind of a feedback loop where you're not getting enough of the moisture out of the room. So we are basically spot ventilating all bathrooms at this point, except for maybe the main bath on, on a home or the powder room on a two story. And I think uh, we are pretty close to the end here. So Jen, listen, that was a blast. Thanks so much <laughs> for uh, coming on and, and uh, sharing some time with us here today. It was really great. Oh, thank to you. Get another voice besides me on this. Um, especially somebody with the level of experience you've got. It was really fantastic. Uh, you know, again, thanks for sponsors. Uh, and, and please stick around, by the way. We've got a couple of, uh, couple of moments, I think, for questions. Uh, Anbridge, as always, thank you so much. Uh, Steph, for being our co-pilot. And thanks to Billing Knowledge for, um, for making you available for us. Uh, Patrick at uh, Intercan and all the work that he's been doing to help, help me with the book, especially, uh, again, my tolerant employer, uh, Dr. Holmes, for allowing me to do this. And also to uh, to my understanding partner Carolyn Terry, my wife, uh, and uh, Graffinstone Canada, and everything that she's bringing to the table, which is pretty cool. So thanks again, and uh, we've got some time for questions. I did want to briefly note though that, and I think Hal's on on, so he's learning about for next week. Uh, Hal Peller is going to be joining us next week, and Hal is it's really cool. He's an improv uh, comic uh, from Brooklyn, New York, and he's a personal friend of mine, and he's also a trainer. Okay. Uh, for lean thinking and and he is really good at it so i'm really excited next week folks tell everybody you know we're going to be doing it's your baby ugly okay and it's going to be i think really informative and a lot of fun so we've got time for a couple questions stuff excellent okay so i'm going to start here with explain what 366 glazing means chat so there's different films or that go on a window in terms of um, look at the different emittance and what it allows through. So 366 is one that tends to reflect the light or the heat uh, solar gains back. Um, there's also another one, 189, that's a, a popular one that's used in high performance homes as well. Yeah, so the manufacturer for the 366 is the Cardinal Glass. Uh, it is readily available. I think both of us have been using it for multiple, multiple years with great success. 
what I really like about the 366 is that it doesn't uh, overshadow the window itself. So you, you still get very good light tra transmittance from it. Okay, thank you. Um, here's one regarding an earth tube. So if there is sufficient real estate for an earth tube ahead of the ventilation system, what is your opinion? How much does it cost? Have you dealt with radon? Does the, does the homeowner understand how they're, what they've signed up for and how they're gonna use it? Uh, what, is, what is your mitigation strategies for if you're gonna have issues with mold, et cetera? So th that, is, uh, that is a very specific custom type of product. Uh, I would say that if, if I had to hazard a guess on anything like that, uh, my mentor, uh, you know, is, is, is who, oh my God, now I'm going to forget the goddamn guys. <laughs> One of the three amigos, Jen, our, I'll get you the name. Oh my God, I'm tired. I'll ask another question. Tex McLeod, there we go. <laughs> ask Tex. If anybody knows on that one, it'll be Tex McLeod. My, my apologies to Tex. Okay, um, for a new house in Metro Vancouver with a forced air uh, furnace, a gas furnace, the prep for the air conditioner is already connected to the furnace. The plan is to install an air conditioning unit. Should it be convenient to use a heat pump instead? Uh, the rough-in for the air conditioner works for, uh, does it, the heat pump, uh, the rough-in for the air conditioner work for a heat pump? You may have to check your wire and uh, your line set. That would be the two things that could impact upon it. So your electric wire and your line set. But in, in theory, yeah, it'll work really, really well as long as it's designed for the same load or you're installing this one that would be for the same load. Yeah, it, that's it what works. I would do. It actually work better. Yeah. I think long term, I, I don't know about anybody else, but when my AC goes at home, I'm switching to a heat pump. And that's basically what I've recommended to any family is, is, is we're getting into an economy where the price of um, electricity is changing and the price of gas is changing at some point, um, we're going to get to electrification. So you might as well start. Okay, um, I know we're at a little bit over. And so just as a reminder to everyone, we are recording this and we will send out the resource email. Uh, but if you want, uh, we can stay on for a few more questions, uh, but we'll, you'll, we'll receive a link to the recording in, in case you do need to go. Perfect. Um, okay, so if we're moving to a cooling dominant environment with climate change and HVAC focus is on cooling, is an airtight fireplace uh, to assist the heating system viable? Uh, potentially, but it's it's it should be one that's actually um, using radiant energy, and it should it should be like it's got to be airtight, right? Uh, the last thing you want to do is is be putting in a big flue that's open into a high performance home because. It, it puts you into a different bracket of code as well. It, 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 so it, there's a lot of thinking that's got to go into it. But uh, there are certain types of, of fireplaces that are designed for that specifically. And, and it, it could be quite successful if you know what you're doing, right? I would also say that continuous fan speed to move air around in that situation would also be important because Otherwise, if it's too close to the thermostat, you're back into that. Well, that feels really comfortable, but the rest of the home is cold. So you want to be able to circulate that air would be highly critical. Okay, just two more questions here. So uh, this person says that they are of the opinion that for a gas furnace, there is not much actual um, gain in efficiency or comfort between a single stage and a two stage. As far as they know, Fully modulating furnaces are uh, relatively recent, limited to certain manufacturers, and are more complicated and costly to repair. So is the advice that the fully modulating gas furnace is the way to go? Yes. When I got ECM motors uh, recognized in the building code, I never thought that they would be doing an ECM motor with a single stage. That would, that would be probably one of the code regrets that I do carry is because we were trying to get modulation in because of how much improvement it provides. So absolutely, it, it, yes, they are a bit more complicated on the, on the repair side, but not once the guys know what they're doing and if they've been doing it enough, 
they'll get the handle on it, it, it and it, it becomes if efficient for them because they understand what they're doing. The issue is, is that when you have a, a single stage furnace and you only need 20,000 BTUs and it's providing 45, your home isn't being efficiently run. And that's a mistake that happens all the time, right? So why the modulation is important is to get us down to match the load of the home, right? Jen? I was just going to say, you're just going to have blast on, blast off with a single stage. If you're in a two-story home, that how that room at the very end of the run is never going to be comfortable because your system is going to blast it on. Your uh, thermostat's going to reach set point almost immediately or fairly quickly, and you're not going to have that air movement throughout the rest of the house. Like It's just going to be uncomfortable. Yeah, I call that the hot and cold dance. We talked about that earlier, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually a, a function that actually happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the last question we have is, um, now this is floor warming versus floor heating. So radiant heating. So the, the comment is, I think in floor warming is a better way to go. You still, you still need to move air around. And in Southwestern Ontario, we get uh, too much change in temperatures to have a floor that takes uh, two days to cool down. So if you wanna just make some comment on that. Yeah, there's some serious benefit to that. Um, the alternative is that when you're doing floor uh, floor heating is set it a little bit lower so you're just taking the chill off and then that's not quite as much of an impact. So there are options there, uh, but it's nice to have, you know, toasty feet in the bathroom, I, I get it. It's, it's really an occupant comfort issue. Some people it will bother more than others. So that comes back to, you know, Robert Bean's principles on, on creating comfort for the occupant. And that's really what we've been talking about over this series is starting to look at things other than insulation, right? What can we do to look at it from the occupant perspective and make them more comfortable? Uh, the four principles I originally talked about was comfort, indoor air quality, carbon, and climate change, right? And so we need to look at all four of those. So yes, they're, they're on somewhat the right track because they're looking at comfort of the occupant. Exactly. Okay, well, those are all the questions that we have today. So I want to thank uh, both Doug and Jen for joining us for this webinar. And I also, of course, want to thank Enbridge for uh, their support and sponsorship of this uh, webinar. We have the next session, as Doug mentioned, it's November the 24th. So be sure to uh, register for that if you haven't done so already. I will be sending out an email, as I mentioned earlier, that will have some of the resources in there, as well as the recording link for, um, for today's session. So thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you have a great week and I'll see you next week. I hope everybody can join us for Is Your Baby Ugly with Mr. Hal Peller. It's going to be really good. It sounds Thanks, like it Doug. will be. You're welcome. Thanks, Doug. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye.